and to try R2 again for Phantom Menace. He had sent me a few uh, little notes here and there saying, gee, when are we gonna do the next movie? Yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. Why don't you do another Star Wars? We had a very difficult time in tracking him down and finally found him. He was at doing dinner theater in um, Sarasota, Florida. When we came back to do uh, The Phantom Menace, he was very excited to be a part of it. And I think he was relieved that his life had direction again. But before he could return to work, R2 had to get in shape. My team was assigned to get him ready for the physical demands of episode one, so we had him on a treadmill for about an hour a day. R2 hit the weights and the pounds melted away. He showed up on the set, there he was all cleaned up. He looked great. And it excited all of us to see him again. As soon as he comes onto set, it was Star Wars for real. Without him, this wouldn't be Star Wars. The honeymoon was not to last. I think the trouble on Phantom Menace started when uh, a script was sent to R2 and he marked it all up and sent it back with a lot of notes to George. If he can kind of beef up his dialogue, he will. Not only does he ad-lib his lines, but he actually goes off in the wrong direction and he goes anywhere he wants. I mean, he's, he's actually doing another movie. The other day he had a line with Obi-Wan, right, and he was meant to say, right, and instead he said, and thought that, like, none of us would know it. You don't talk droid, do you? The incident with Obi-Wan, played by Scottish actor Ewan McGregor, was symptomatic of a deeper problem. If he had his way, he'd have Ewan's part. And I think Ewan kind of knows that. The other day he said, out my way, you Scottish wanker, to Ewan. No, R2 has changed. I mean, it's, you know, he's not the same droid. He was actually quite humble when I found him. He slags off the other actors. I, I know that he always, always slags off George. As time went on, the problems deepened. Sometimes he comes to the set and can't even remember who he is. There's been rumor that this, he likes to drink. I think there are times that, you know, he um, might use a little too much oil. R2 blamed his performance problems on the director. He says that George basically didn't ever give him any direction whatsoever, that he did everything himself. You know, Rick Dreyfuss and a lot of the other actors have always complained that I treat the actors like robots. His favorite direction is faster, more intense. Yeah, it's faster and more intense. Or same thing, only better. And that may be true. I've never really had a problem with a droid. You just push the remote and they go where you want them to go. Except for R2. You push the remote, doesn't do what you want them to do. Uh, argues about everything, you know, is always constantly trying to get into his character, always wants to know his motivation. There was a point where we had a very uh, difficult time. I kind of lost it a little bit. And um, I did light up a blowtorch in front of him, but I didn't use it. R2 told friends he was holding the production together single-handedly. R2 thinks he is the star of Star Wars. And this is something I've talked to him about. I said, you know, there are other people in it, you know, me, for instance. When it's his close-up, you know, I give him my full performance. And then when it's my close-up, he just reads it from a little page. And it affects my work. As problems mounted, George Lucas began to ponder the unthinkable. There was a discussion that we might create a digital R2. You know, he could just be gone. And nobody would know the difference. Probably, you know, the CG R2 would be much, much better and would be on time in the morning. It's when the girls started coming around. It's these girls, man, in these short dresses and these tight clothes, man. It's like something he hadn't been exposed to. He certainly doesn't have any problem attracting them, so there must be something there. I guess it's just the way he looks. I can't deny that he's a good-looking robot. R2's pension for the ladies was complicated by the fact that he was now in a committed relationship. He has a lot of other girlfriends, but I'm his only girlfriend. Every week you go by a spot, man, it's like, you know, three, four chicks laying around there, hanging around his pool. There have been times when R2 has been promiscuous. If you put a private eye on him, you'd be amazed. However understanding I tried to be, I just, I can't accept that. My parents raised me not to accept being cheated on by a robot. If his romantic problems weren't enough, R2 was suddenly overwhelmed when word came from England his father was dead. It was a shock to us all, and it was difficult to break the news to R2 as we hadn't spoken in years. He did not take it very well. R2 is nearing a crisis point. Oh, man! Gosh. Once his father died, I knew the pressure was building in him, and something was going to blow. He's been mad! And uh, it happened. It eventually happened there in Sydney. Distraught over the death of his father, R2 staged a stunt that shocked everyone around him. He's trying to prove to himself that he was 
strong enough to face anything. Well, I think that leap part of it was just a, a stunt to get attention. It really comes out of the Indiana Jones thing. Both Stephen and I said, you know, you really aren't going to be up for these stunts. And he said, oh, I can do that, I can do that. And I think part of this was a call, especially after his father died, to branch out and prove that he could do a lot of things he'd been bragging about. His terrified fans begged him not to do it. But R2 was determined. Suddenly, everything went horribly wrong. This is crazy, Don. We're really going to do something. He's out of control. We were able to resuscitate him by acting quickly and, and preserving all his body parts. Does anybody have his arm? I'm sorry. R2's near death experience changed him forever. When I called him in the hospital, he was overwhelmed. He could barely speak. He was particularly touched by the messages of support from the fans. His demons behind him, R2 emerged from the ordeal stronger than ever. After that jump, I think he began to come to his senses. I began to see the old R2, the, the inner core, the, the loving R2 came back. R2 returned triumphantly to the set of episode two, proving an inspiration to everyone around him. I think the main reason I did episode two is because I wanted to do a picture with R2-D2. I don't, as yet, have any scenes with R2-D2, but I'm going to have a word with George. He's trying a little harder this time. I could tell. In fact, R2 was a changed man. He began to devote himself to his favorite causes. He does a lot for kids. He loves kids, and he's constantly going out of his way to sign autographs and entertain kids. And wherever there's a kid's charity, you're going to see R2. This guy, if people only knew, man, what he does, he's like one of the most benevolent cats in the world. You know, his generosity goes in many ways. I mean, he shared things with me. He's given me some of his parts sometimes. I mean, you know, not Shakespeare. I mean, like, it's a metal. But, you know, whatever he can, he gives. Overcoming his anguished family history, conquering his professional frustrations, R2-D2 has emerged triumphant once again. He's had a very difficult life, and given that, uh, I think he does, he copes very well with it. The inner core of R2 is a loving, kindly being. He's my man, you know. He's done stuff for me, man, that nobody else would do. He even won back the love of his life, and perhaps the best is yet to come. I think I might be pregnant. <laughs>